know I have not uh, uh, told you to do this. I have not set you up to do this, but uh, as a man of God who's always ready to pray, please invite the presence of the Lord Mfundisi, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I know you are there. Are you able to, I think you are muted. Yes, Mfundisi, thank you so kindly. Over to you. I don't know if I'm audible, Mr. Mbinga. You are, are you very, able? Clear. very clear, you are very clear. Okay, shall we pray together? Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, we truly glorify your name this morning. We want to thank you, Father, for giving us life. In these days of COVID-19, in these mm. days of crime and hatred, of robbers breaking into people's houses, taking things away from them. You have preserved us, Father. We kneel before you this morning to really thank you, Father, because you are an amazing God. We cannot exchange you for any other God. Thank you, Father, for giving us this day. This is the day, Lord, that you have given us yes. to show forth your praises to declare to the world, to show the world what you have done for us. Accept Amen. our praise, accept our worship, accept our testimonies. Doesn't your word say they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the Amen. word of their testimonies? May our testimonies bring somebody closer to you today. May you speak to someone and strengthen their faith through the testimonies that will be shared here today. Thank you, Father. You told us that we ought always to pray, that we should pray without ceasing. That's why we are on this platform pleading with you, wrestling with you. Yes. And you know, Father, that this morning, each person here represented, represents some some tough things that they are grappling with but despite of the heavy things that we are grappling with we came mm -hmm. not to ask but to testify of your goodness you are amazing mm -hmm. father we pray for each member we pray for the leadership of this tea, of this platform bless us today may we grow in our faith may we grow in knowing you is our prayer in jesus name amen Amen. Amen. Fundisi. Thank you so kindly for praying for God's people and for all of us. Friends, we want to thank Dr. Maposa for praying for us. And I can tell you, I can tell you, uh, you know, I, we are talking, myself and Dr. Maposa. He's just very busy now, itinerating, going to sessions, going to executive meetings. But um, I know he's going to come here very soon. Just watch the space. God is going to bring him here and he's going to be blessing us with his presence. Thank you so kindly. Once again, we want to thank our, our pastor, our guest speaker for this week. Uh, Muruti Simangane, God has used you mightily. You don't know. God has used you mightily. And you know very, for a fact that I've said it and I will repeat it again, that you are one of my favorite pastors. Amongst pastors that I... I, I love and I, I appreciate you are one of them. And um, I, I follow your ministry and I know God is using you mightily. And thank you once again for being with us here. This is your time, Muruti. Take, take it up. Thank you so much, Elder Minga. And the love indeed is reciprocated. And thank you. Dr. Maposa, leader of the General Conference in this region, Southern Africa. I greet you all, beloved sons and daughters of the living God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our brother. Amen. The Sabbath is a day of rest, and what an opportunity it is to start this morning together with the saints on this blessed Sabbath day. The Bible says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy rest. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. We trust in God's love and care. 
we receive God's free and full salvation. And on the Sabbath, we express our faith in what he has done for us by simply resting, knowing that our God is in control and that he has accomplished not just creation and completed that, but he has accomplished and completed the work of our salvation. I would like us this morning to do a very brief recap of our messages over the course of the week. We have explored the tapestry of the Lord's Prayer using the theme of the family of God as a land. We are, aren't we, the children of the Father. And so we pray and address God as our Father, our Father who art in heaven. We saw in Genesis 1 that the first thing that God does for his children upon creation is bless them. The blessing appears to be twofold. Firstly, it is purpose. Be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over the earth. God places them as his ambassadors, as it were. They were to be stewards and they were to be images of God himself on the earth, extending and representing God, extending the kingdom of God. Uh, this entails the stewardship and the responsibility that we have as sons and daughters of God. And so as children in the family, we have a responsibility to advance the cause of the family. And this is why we pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When God adopts us, beloved, as children, he co-opts us in uh, kingdom affairs. And God places us in places uh, strategically to fulfill his purposes uh, so that um, the will of the Father is done on earth. Just like he did for Esther, placing her in the palace. And Mordecai comes to her and says, could it not be that for such a time as this, you have been placed there? And so for each and every one of us, if we are sons and daughters of God, our lives are not up to chance and mistake. God has placed us strategically in the right places to fulfill our Father's will on earth. We must be about our Father's business. But then secondly, the blessing is about provision. So firstly, we say the blessing is about purpose. But secondly, it appears to also be about provision. This is why it says, I have given you seed bearing fruit for food. In other words, I've given you everything for your sustenance, everything that you will need, I will supply. And this is why we pray, give us this day our daily bread. What I like about the Garden of Eden is that God had already made the provisions available before he placed them there. And so before we arrive somewhere, before we get there, God has already set out the table. God has already set out the provisions. We, not, we do not need to be worried. Uh, that is why Jesus says, why are you worried about tomorrow? What you shall eat and what you shall think, you know, what you shall wear, what you shall do not worry about this. Things, for God knows what you need. Is that not so? And, 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 and so we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And when we utter that prayer, we do not come as beggars, but as children. Like Mephibosheth, who was brought into the family, into the king's household. He came to the table as a child of the king and sat there as a child of the king. Not begging, but receiving of the provisions of the father, King David. And so, beloved, we also come not as beggars but his sons and daughters and God shall provide. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. But we quickly realize that uh, the temptation is very close. Genesis chapter three quickly comes into the picture. And this is why we pray, lead us not into temptation. Now, if purpose is what we do for God and what you do for others, then provision is what you get, is what you receive, is what is done for you. Purpose comes with responsibility and is easy to despise, just like Esau despised his birthright that came with the demands upon him in the household of faith. 
And so we would um, easily say, give me the fruit rather, uh, even if I lose my status over the earth. Uh, this is selfishness and ultimately it spills our purpose and the balance of purpose and provision is important. Uh, this is why Esau simply says, give me the bowl of soup, even if it forfeits his own purpose. This beloved distorts our purpose on the earth and we need to have these two in balance. Is this not why uh, Jesus said, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And is this not why Christ says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And my food is to do the will of my father and to finish his work. Now, purpose, focus on uh, provision and uh, uh, selfishness uh, supports this kingdom mission, your father's business with your talents, with your time, with your tithes and offerings and with everything that you have. Focus on uh, the kingdom purposes, not just on the selfish issues of what you need to sustain your life. Focus on how you shall support your father's business. Give your tithes, give your offerings, give your talents, give everything that you can for in so doing, you will be like Christ. And so, beloved, we came to the conclusion uh, yesterday of how the Lord's prayer concludes. And there we find that it says, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Uh, this beloved is an acknowledgement that there is another who seeks his throne, an imposter who would like to be worshipped as well. And we must choose this day whom we shall serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And as prophecy points out, uh, it often seems that the devil shall win. It often seems that he shall have the last word. But Jesus has triumphed over principalities and uh, the powers of this world through the cross of Calvary. So set your eyes upon Jesus. Look upon the cross for through the blood you shall have the victory. And today, beloved, I wish to look at how it all ends and how indeed this kingdom shall come and how indeed his is the kingdom and how the whole earth shall be placed under his rulership. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. This will be a brief message. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peals of thunder, shouting hallelujah. And I wish somebody could type that hallelujah, hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad in it and give glory to God. Oh, that we would give him all the glory for he deserves it. He is worthy of our praise. And he is what the Bible says for the wording of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Oh, beloved, who is that bride? We are the bride. We are the bride. And the Bible says the bride has made herself ready. The bride has been made ready. The grass with us and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Beloved, with the devil defeated and expelled, with the expulsion of Azazel and with the final destruction of death, itself comes the marriage of the sub the marriage supper of the lamb that day beloved is not far Jesus is coming and Jesus is coming very soon. If you did not know it, I want you to simply look around. The Bible says, when you shall see these things come to pass, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Redemption is a biblical theme. The book of Ruth presents to us a fascinating story of marriage and of redemption. And I want to close our series today by focusing on marriage and redemption in the context of our family, God's family. Look at this. Naomi had lost everything. She left Bethlehem because of a drought with her husband and went to seek refuge in a land called Moab. And when she gets there, unfortunately, not only does she 
lose that which she came to preserve, but she gets there and loses her husband. Her husband dies, and while she is mourning that her two sons, after 10 years, die also. And so she is left without a husband, left without sons. And that was a tragedy of tragedies for a woman in those days, a widow in those times. What should she do? She decides, I shall return for there is nothing for me here. Let me go back home. And so in going back home, she has two daughters-in-law. One is called Ruth and the other is called Opa. Opa responds to her pleadings for she says, I have nothing to offer you, no future for you. And so go back and offer returns. But Ruth says, your God will be my God and your people will be my people. Not even death shall separate us. Oh, beloved, that is what we call chesed, that kind of a commitment. And so I see in Ruth what God is pleased with upon his children. When we can say, we will be your children. We will be, you will be to us our God. And so she, go, she goes with uh, she goes with Naomi into Bethlehem. And when she goes, what she does not know is that God will step after step lead her to what will redeem the family's fortunes, what will redeem the family's lost properties, what will redeem everything that they had lost. But how would that redemption come? God had made a provision in the Old Testament that nothing that is lost in terms of property should be lost forever. God had given them heritage and had given them a land and he said if you lose the land if you lose this for whatever reason I have made provisions that it shall be restored and how shall it be restored it shall be restored by way of a kinsman redeemer right there if you can't say to somebody next to you kinsman redeemer he is our kinsman redeemer follow this with me this was a marriage of a kinsman redeemer when the bible speaks of us of the marriage supper of the lamb beloved this is a kinsman kinsman redeemer that is getting married. This is a kinsman redeemer that is marrying a bride. And what does a kinsman redeemer do? You see, God made provision for Israelites never to be landless forever. If you lost any land, whether it fell because of hard time, whether it was because you had to sell it, or whether it was by some misfortune or some lost property, God made it so that you were entitled to buy it back. And so you could get some fortunes back and you had the rights to get that land back. But if you could not get the land back, if you could not get what you forfeited or what you sold back, then the Bible made a provision for a kinsman, somebody in the family, somebody close who had the resources. And this somebody who had the resources could go and redeem what you had lost. And if you were a woman, if you were a widow, the Bible made a provision that you you could also have your family continued so that your husband's line could be continued and this land could carry on from generation to generation. The inheritance could be passed on within your family. Oh, beloved, I have simply come by to let you know that Boaz, who married Ruth, came as a kinsman redeemer to redeem the land and in marrying to make sure that the inheritance got back to the family. Boaz was a picture, a little window through which we could see Christ. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. You see, God has made a provision so that what Adam lost would be redeemed, so that what Adam lost could be redeemed through the consummation of marriage. Upon marriage, the kinsman redeemer, uh, who marries the bride, redeemed also the property. Listen to this. The kinsman redeemer had to be part of the family, and so uh, Boaz was part of the family. Hey, there is somebody closer to us in relations than I am, he says. Uh, let me go and check with him if he will marry you, Ruth. Uh, but if he does not marry you, then I definitely will marry you. And the whole night, 
he says, I will be there negotiating at the gate. And if he does not do that, wait till the morning. And in the morning, I will come and I will do the duty of a kinsman redeemer. Beloved, it is night. And just like Ruth and Naomi, we are waiting all night. And we are waiting. But I want to let you know that Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. I have made a down payment. I have paid my lobola. I made the away. It might be a long night. It might be a painful night. But weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. And the Bible says that though there was trouble, though there was a beast that came, though there was a dragon that came, and though there was persecution that came, the Bible says that they came the morning when the beast was cast out, when the dragon was cast out. There is a day that is coming when we shall study war no more. There is a day that is coming when there shall, there shall be corona no more. There is a day that is coming when there shall be poverty no more, weeping no more, fighting no more, stress no more, depression no more, children with addiction no more. A day is coming when indeed the master shall come and he is not just a master. He is a kinsman redeemer. Why kinsman? Because he is part of the family. He is closer than closer. He took our flesh and took our blood. Our blood runs in his veins. When he came into the world and became a part of the human family, he became a kinsman. And because he was God, he, like Boaz, was a rich man. He had the stuff that we did not have. He could pay the price that we could not pay. He could redeem what we had lost. And Jesus is our redeemer. And so on the marriage day, he is like Boaz, who marries for redemption, who marries for inheritance to be brought back on that day, the Bible says that the land shall be brought back. Read the book of Daniel. Daniel says that in the kingdom shall be returned to the sons and daughters of God. Read the prophecies and they will tell you that on that day, though it seemed like the devil had the kingdoms, though it seemed like, like Babylon, that uh, middle Asia, though it seemed like Greece, though it seemed like Rome and all those that persecuted the people, though it seemed that the land was theirs, that the earth was theirs. The Bible tells me that that day when Jesus comes, this kingdom shall belong to the sons and daughters of God. This is why Ephesians says, and this is why Paul keeps repeating that if we are in Christ, we are co-heirs with Christ because that which Adam lost is indeed restored. Oh, beloved, I wish you could redeem. I wish you could accept the message today and say that Jesus, you are my savior. You are my kinsman redeemer. The day is coming. When I was born, my parents held my little form and they said he will be called Oetha. Translated, that means he is coming. Oh, help me close this message today. On the Sabbath day, we are resting while waiting for oh. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is even at the door. And when he comes, beloved, I cannot wait for that day because gravity will not have its hold on us. All of us shall get out of our houses, get out of our workplaces and look up and see a sight for the skies shall break. We shall look up when the trumpet shall sound and each of us shall hear our name. And below, while we are excited about it, the Bible says we shall not precede those that have gone gone ahead. Those that have passed away in Jesus, if you have lost a loved one, if you have lost somebody close to you while tears are running in your eyes, Paul says, do not weep as those that have no hope. Because on that day, the dead in Christ shall rise. Oh, beloved, we shall see them coming up out of their graves, rising up to meet the Lord. But we too shall come up and gravity will not have its hold. And I like how Ellen White describes it. It shall be a tour towards the new Jerusalem. Oh, come on with me. For I shall pass the sun, moon, and stars. And I shall go past Jupiter, Venus, and Mars. And on that day, I shall get 
past the gates that shout hallelujah as the saints go marching in. I can see us as the great human family standing on the sea of glass. Adam, who brought us into the mess, shall stand next to Adam, who redeemed us from the mess. And on that sea, we shall wave palms of victory. And the question when it is asked, who are these? These are they that have come out of great tribulation. So, beloved, whatever you're going through, this is the patience of the saints. Please endure in Jesus' name. Don't give up, for you are more than conquerors in Jesus. In Jesus, we are with him in the grave. With Jesus, we are with him on Sunday morning in the resurrection. In Jesus, we ascend with him and listen to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 says, and he that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Oh, beloved, this promise is too great for my human mind because Paul himself says, don't you know what you shall be? Don't you know that you shall judge angels? Don't you know that the kingdom is not just about what you shall enjoy and receive? It shall be plenty that you shall receive, but also like the queen, you will have purpose. When the king marries you, oh Esther, you will have purpose. You shall rule over the kingdoms. You shall judge angels. Beloved, I am saying to you that that day shall come when we, the church, shall become the bride of Christ. And on that day, that which Adam and Eve lost shall be regained. What have you lost? Our God is a redeemer. Is that not why Job says, I know ha, that my redeemer liveth. And though my flesh is destroyed with my own eyes, shall I see him? I know that my redeemer liveth. He is my redeemer and he is a kinsman redeemer. Is that not why Hebrews says he is not ashamed to be called our brother. He is next of kin. Beloved, I cannot contain this. For when I look at the Godhead, in the Godhead is our brother, one that looks like us. When we are restored, we are restored to a higher position, Ellen White says, than what we lost at the beginning. And so in redemption, the cross brings us to greater glory than we had at creation. Hallelujah. Oh, beloved, that you would accept such a great and full salvation in Jesus' name. That day is coming. Prepare ye to meet the Lord in Jesus name. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of the gospel. We thank you for the promise that what has been lost shall be restored and redeemed, and that our kinsman redeemer has made every provision. He has the stuff. He's paid it all on the cross, but not only that, he is coming just like Boaz to marry his church, and on that day, all the misfortunes shall be our fortunes. On that day, all that was lost shall be regained. We shall say together with Job, our Redeemer liveth, and we shall see with Job that that which was lost is less than that which shall be gained in the latter days. Father in heaven, here are your children. On the day that you come, may all of us be accepted in your kingdom. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.